When you want to make your big, powerful fantasy hero or villain even more imposing, you give him one of these, right? A massive two-handed bludgeon for epic brutality. But when we look at museums and collections, what do we see primarily? A whole lot of pole arms with blades and smaller single-handed maces and warhammers and such. So where are all the two-handed maces at? Did they even exist in real life history? Maces in their various forms and sizes have been around for a very long time. People decided that a simple club isn't enough, so they attached something to it to create Club Plus, the enhanced version, which is a mace. They could be spiked or smooth and round or knobbed. Sounds like a different kind of implement. Anyway, so we have a large variety of different types. When you look, for example, at this roughly 2000 year old mace from Egypt, if you didn't know it was made of copper, you might think it's medieval. Right? For the longest time, this weapon consisted of a wooden haft with a mace head of various materials. That was still the case in the early Middle Ages and still common even in the High Middle Ages. For example, here's a depiction from early 14th century England. You see a ball mace on the right and a club on the left. So here you have someone who was able to afford plate armor but used a simple, apparently wooden club. Kind of odd. And then in the late Middle Ages and Renaissance, you get the iconic all steel flanged mace, which by the way, was not heavy. You might think so with an all metal construction, but real life historical weapons were not as clunky and heavy as fantasy weapons because speed could very well make the difference between life or death. So where are the two handed maces and warhammers? What you predominantly see is shorter versions. And then you have various pole arms, pole hammers, knightly pole axes. Those are all characterized by having something more going on than just a mace or hammer. There is usually a blade attached to it or various spikes. Now, of course, any hafted weapon can be used with two hands. I mean, you've got all this, there is no guard, there is no blade. It's just, you can grip <laughs> anywhere from down here all the way to up there. Here's a picture from England, 1275 to 1300, where you see a regularly sized mace swung with both hands. Early 14th century France, there's a guy swinging a spiked mace with both hands who promptly gets cut in the head with a sword because the haft is too short and he just doesn't have the reach he needs. At least that's my reading of it. In this German image from 1445, there's a spiked mace also used with both hands, which happens to look exactly like a surviving example from a torture museum. Let that sink in for a moment. A torture museum. Aren't we a fun species? We're so obsessed with causing pain and suffering that we can fill entire museums with torture devices. And in this picture from mid 15th century France, everybody is swinging for the fences. Doesn't matter if it's sword, warhammer or mace, everybody is double fisting it and going to town. So why would you do that? Well, perhaps your shield was destroyed and had to be discarded. So instead of letting your offhand hang there like a tyrannosaur, you decide to just use it to enhance your strikes with your main weapon. And if you're encased in plate armor, you're not as worried about it. You can tank some hits. Now, you would in that case be much better off with a longer pole arm, for, of course, that is designed for two-handed use and that gives you that much more reach, which of course, generally they did. But on the battlefield, sometimes manure happens and then you might end up doing this. However, there is some pictorial evidence of true two-handed maces. For example, this from 1450 Germany. This picture from Poland, 1451, may be a pole arm sized mace, looking at how it's positioned. This one is kind of drawn oddly, and then it has additional spikes on the bottom, which it might have had. We have to be careful about pictures because sometimes people drew weird stuff, you know, like killer bunnies and all that. But uh, we definitely see a lot of stuff shown. In fact, the majority of what you see in pictures, we have archeological evidence of. And the thing is, if you simply search two-handed mace, you don't find a whole lot that's not fantasy. But if you search for pole arms and keep an eye open, suddenly you find that there are 
pole arm sized maces hiding amidst all the other pole arms. Here, for example, you have a long flanged mace with a square or triangular spike on top and uh, also a large spiked mace. In this picture, we have several long wooden maces with bulbous spiked ends. And here's an oddity, a spiked mace with an unusual blade mounted on top. It almost looks like a miniature partisan head attached to it. And unfortunately, there's, I couldn't find any info other than that it's French 16th century might be two-handed. Here's a 16th century morning star, which looks related to the golden dog that I've covered in another video, link down below if you haven't seen that yet. And interestingly, there are examples of the golden dog with additional spikes where that basically turn it into a hybrid between a golden dog and a spiked mace. In fact, you can easily call a golden dog a spiked mace. So what do all of these have in common? that also distinguishes them from most fantasy two-handed maces and hammers and whatnot. You can thrust with them. Clearly, people valued this a lot. I mean, this. This could easily, without the spike, this could just be a war club, right? But they thought it important to add the spike, the same way as with a lot of spiked or flanged maces, they put additional spikes on top. Not so much with the single-handed versions, interestingly enough, but the two-handed ones, pole arms, they found it very important, clearly, to put spikes on top. Not every time, but very noticeably common. And why wouldn't you? Sure, this by itself is a perfectly good weapon, powerful, has plenty of reach, but it removes one particular type of attack, thrusts, which are really quite useful in combat. Yes, you can shove someone and, I mean, if you jam this, even if it's blunt, in someone's face, you can do a lot of damage, of course. But particularly when dealing with armor, it can be useful to have that spike. Sure, you can just bludgeon the armor, that's what this is good at, but what if you end up in close range? You might actually be able to grip this high and jam it into the gaps of the armor. There's just additional things you can do, and it doesn't really cost you much of anything. So I think it's at least part of why this form is not seen as commonly. The flaw with this argument, of course, is they didn't seem to have done that much to single-handed ones. Shorter maces sometimes have spikes on top, but often don't. Uh, single-handed warhammers quite often do have spikes on top. So they didn't always do it. There must have been other reasons. But either way, they did exist. You have to dig a little more deeply. They're not as easy to find as more conventional pole arms, but they exist. So finally, I just want to show you a few other interesting examples that I found while looking for these. There are a number of pictures of maces from India that look two-handed. When you just see them in the picture and you just go by the proportions, you think, oh, that, that looks two-handed, but they're not actually that large. In fact, here is one from North India, 17th century. It looks long enough to be a, a two-handed mace, a polar mace, basically, but it's actually surprisingly short and thin. I found something from the 18th century on Oriental arms labeled battle mace, and I have to disagree with that. When looking at the, at the measurements, you can see that it's only 89 centimeters or 35 inches long. So I put this into Photoshop and scaled it to the right dimensions and then measured how thick it is. And it turns out with those proportions at a length of 89 centimeters, the handle would have a diameter of 0.76 centimeters or a third of an inch. This pen is slightly thicker than that. I don't think you could use this as a weapon. Just my opinion. For comparison, this mace is 76 centimeters long and would scale to a diameter of about 1.6 centimeters. That's a lot more reasonable. It's still fairly thin, but definitely more plausible than the other one. And of course, the more you look around the world, the more examples you find. For instance, here's a weapon from New Guinea that looks like a two-handed mace, and also examples from Fiji and Vanuatu. It's hard to tell the size here, so the proportions could be deceiving again, but they look fairly long, and I would guess that they were probably used with two hands. Whatever rule you want to define or whatever observation you want to make, there's 
almost always exceptions to be found somewhere. There's even an early 15th century French painting that shows a maul being used by a knight. No spikes, just straight up hammer. One function only, crushing your enemy. Anyway, hope you found this interesting. By the way, if you like this LARP mace, I'll leave a link in the description to where you can buy it. It's quite well made actually. And um, yeah, hope you got entertained and perhaps learned something. Thanks for watching. Take care, folks. Thank you.